Hello and a very warm welcome to The Real Talk. Our guest today heads arguably what is the biggest bank in the country. And I'm excited to be having this conversation with her. We're coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu. My name is Jackie Lumbasi. Our guest is Patience Mutesi. Patience, do I call you Patience? Do I call you Pesh? Anything you're comfortable with. I, I say prefer that to my colleagues all the time. Yeah. Whatever you're comfortable with. I prefer with. Pesh. Nice. It is a pleasure to have you here a with us. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Thank you for honoring our invitation. Sure. How has your day been like? My day has been good so far. Um, I think the least busy day I've had this week. But as you can imagine, yes. banking is one of those things where you're always on your toes, well, always it's running busy up, days. Uh, up and down, in yeah. and out of meetings. Yeah. But so far, so good. I'm we happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tell us a little bit about patience. You know, we often will see people sprout out of nowhere and then somebody is heading the biggest company in the country. Rarely do we get to know where this all started. Yeah. So if you can bless us with that today. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how much time you have, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you the whole day, but for starters, let me give you five minutes for okay, that. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much again for having me, Jackie. So when I'm talking about my journey, I find it very difficult to separate myself from my parents, right? Yeah. So my journey really started with my parents who um, were born in Rwanda, but had to leave the country in the early, the late 1950s. Mm. So they left Rwanda and then settled in refugee camps in, um, in Uganda. So I proudly associate myself as a refugee child, uh, oh. even as I was growing up. I knew it was very clear and I knew that I was, uh, you know, a daughter of refugees. So my parents settled in uh, refugee camps in Uganda to separate refugee camps, but they were family friends. Um, fortunately got an education so my dad was a chemist by training and my mom although she didn't get into university was really more into education um, then they moved to Uganda to from Uganda to Kenya um, so my journey started in Kenya they got married in Kenya um, had me I'm the second born of four siblings mm -hmm. uh, we were born in a village called uh, Moranga Ooh, la, la. So that's usually a very nice conversation starter. Yeah. You know, for my friends uh, in Kenya, I like to say yeah. I'm born in Moranga. In Moranga. And so you look like people in Moranga. You look like a Kikuyu, 100%. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So yes, we were, I was born in Moranga, in Moranga where my dad was the head of a chemistry department in a school called Njeri's High School. Mm -hmm. um, and wow. then we moved to Nairobi when dad went to do his master's in the UK. And then uh, late 1980s, we moved to Uganda, back to Uganda, because obviously the politics changed, the regime changed. So um, the formative years of my life were in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Uganda where I did primary school. When we settled in Uganda, we were in a town called Jinja. Yeah. I went to what I would like, I like to say was the best school in Jinja, Victoria Nile School, for <laughs> Victoria Nile Primary School, um, for primary school, and then from primary school, I moved to Mary Hill High School, which is in Barara, Barara yeah. and then from Barara for A-level, I went to Navisunsa, which is in Kampala, so my family at that time had settled in Kampala, so that has kind of been my, what was my, the journey of my early life. So I like to say to myself that, or to anyone who wants to listen, that I consider myself a typical East African. That's exactly what you are. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So that was my early life. Um, I did my university in uh, Makere University, where I studied a bachelor's in, Bachelor of Science in Quantitative Economics. Mm -hmm. So I'm really a statistician uh, by shop training. Shop people, shop people. <laughs> by training, but trust me, uh, if you, you ask never practiced. me anything about it, <laughs> that's really not my greatest strength. Yeah. And then I moved back to Rwanda in 2004 when I finished university, really because I was seeing everything happening in Rwanda. Yeah. And I was very excited to be part of the growth of this country. And since then, I've done so much. Uh, I mean, very many different things. Uh, my career journey started out uh, in what was Intercontinental Hotel. Uh -huh. It didn't end very well. It was a very short stint there, uh, about four months or so. I was As a what? Really, what were you doing I, there? So it was a very interesting thing because I 
before I moved from Uganda, I had got a job offer with Crane Bank. And then I came here for a weekend and decided, you know what, I think I'm staying here. So I went back to Kampala, packed up my bags, and said, I'm coming to, uh, to job hunt. And a friend of and mine... And you was, left the offer, the Crane Bank offer? I left the offer, offer yes. Yeah. I left the offer because I knew for a fact that I wanted to be here. Okay. That one weekend has, had completely changed my perspective wow. about Kigali. Um, so then the first offer I got when I came to Rwanda, a friend of mine was working in Intercontinental and they say, we have, we're setting up a marketing department, come and be part of it. So I go and no job description, <laughs> like it was really very vague what I was no doing. No contract. There. No contract. This was about August uh, 2004 and then up to December 2004 and it just ended that quickly oh, but it, immediately after I got a job in a microfinance so I started out in microfinance so my heart is really for micro businesses beautiful um, worked there for about just almost a year and then went into banking so my journey in banking started in uh, 2005 I worked with I, the BCR which is now INM Bank left BCR as the deputy head of corporate banking, moved to Ecobank where I was the head of corporate banking but also overseeing the cluster for East Africa which had six countries for corporate banking. And then in Ecobank I just felt, you know, I, I need something different from banking. Uh, the opportunity at Trademark came up and I went to Trademark East Africa as the country director where I was for six and a half years. And then just recently moved to BPR as managing director. So that has been my journey from the start to where I am today. That is a beautiful story. Thank you. Growing up and moving from one country to another and seeing your parents leave home to go study. Did you envision this? What did you want to become mm. Yeah, when you grew up? You know, uh, my parents did not restrict us on what we wanted to do. So growing up, I really wanted to get into the arts. And my parents were okay with it. My dad had this mantra, whatever you decide to do, be the very best at it. Whatever you want to do, do, the, do it. Do it very and best. be the best at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And this was a, a man who was a chemist. So you would yeah. imagine that he would have wanted all of us to go into the that, sciences. Yes, that wrote the sciences. Exactly. But he really gave us a platform to be the best that we could be. Oh. I never at any one time envisioned myself to be where I am today. But I knew one thing for sure, that whatever I chose to be, it would have to be something where I have to interact with people yeah. because that's where I get my energy. Yeah. yeah. And so you were appointed the managing director of BPR. And it was just shortly after the merger. How did you feel about it? That appointment come? Is it a job that you applied for? Yeah. Did you receive it excitedly or were you a bit apprehensive? Yeah, that's a good question. So before I became managing director for BPR, I sat on the board of BPR yeah. from February 2022. I was heading the uh, or chairing the, the credit committee. And so, you know, built relationships within the organization. And one thing that KCB was very clear about was that they wanted to domesticate the bank. So the biggest number, a very big percentage of the board is currently Rwandans. And they were very clear, they had made a commitment to the government that they were going to get a local managing director. So the group came to us as the board and said, you know, help us to find uh, a managing director. So I'm really like looking out for people, making <laughs> recommendations. Making calls. Yeah, at, at, there's no single time where I thought about myself as potentially the managing director of BPR. And then, uh, and this is very common wow. with women that yeah. I, I can't tell you the number of people I talk to, talk to and they say, but why don't you consider that job? You have everything that it takes to do the job well. Why aren't you thinking about it? The first person you're like, oh, come on, of course yeah. not. The second person you're like, really? The third person, and then it gets to like the fifth person and you're like, wait a minute. It can't be a mistake that all these people are seeing something that I'm not seeing. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And I got over, you know, the imposter syndrome. I got over that little voice that tells you you don't have what it takes to do the job. And uh, I presented my interest to the group, uh, the KCB group. And it was such a sigh of relief, uh, I think, for them because the whole time they were saying, help us to find, they just, no one in the group could say to me, you could do this job. So it was, I think, a bit and of And yet a they had thought about it silently. I, I believe they had. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I believe they had. So when yeah. you know when I expressed interest, obviously I went through the interview process. So yeah. I did. I did say, is there anything in your policies that would stop me from applying for the job? And Considering the was, you are already on the board, exactly. And the answer was absolutely not. <sighs> Some people have done it. They do an excellent job, so please go ahead and express interest. So I did apply for the job. I did wow. go through an interview process, and then at the end of last year, I was, you know, I was selected as the successful candidate, and I feel really grateful for the opportunity to serve in this role. I was happy. Thank you. As a loyal BPR customer, Thank I was you. so happy to see you That's get really there. That's really kind of you to yeah. say, Jackie. Thanks. And how is it going so far? So far, so good. Um, I joined at the most um, interesting time. And I choose that word very carefully because there are two sets of people who had completely different opinions, uh, and I was in one of those groups. So you have the optimists who are saying to, to me, Listen, you are so lucky to join this bank at such a difficult moment because this is the worst it could ever be. Everything that will come after will be such a smooth ride. Those are the optimists. Mm. And then you have the pessimists who are like, you must be a crazy woman to take this job at this time. What were you thinking? Your reputation, Your reputation. is on the line. And indeed, um, when I joined the bank, um, we went live with a co-banking system on 23rd of January, and I took on this job on 1st of February, seven days after going live with a new system. Yeah. And you can imagine even for the smallest business, you, you change your banking, I mean your system, it comes with so many challenges. Yeah. So now you can imagine for a bank, that has almost a million customers, that has over 150 branches, that has over 500,000 shareholders, that has, you know, all these things that you are exposed. It was a very difficult moment. But in everything, I'm really thankful to God for the yeah. grace. Um, he gave me a lot of grace. He gave all the staff of BPR a lot of grace yeah. because in the branches they were dealing with you know, frustrated customers, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, our customers were really frustrated. I, oh, I was, you know, I considered leaving yeah, the bank. I know that. <laughs> That's the point I didn't think, and it took really long. I remember the biggest frustration was that my visa card took how long, and here I was, you know, I'm the person that is recruiting everyone, telling them this is going to work out, yeah. this is a good thing. Yeah. But here I am, I have nothing yeah, to... Yeah. To prove that this is going to be good. I kept calling the bank asking, when is my bank, my card coming? Yeah. At least let me have the visa card, then I can convince people yeah. that theirs will be coming. Will come. so, yeah. yeah. So, you know? I mean, the good thing is that today as we speak, you can get an ins a visa card instantly. Yeah. In our branches, you walk into the branch, fill in up an application, and they will process your card immediately. Yeah. So the, the, the beauty about going through this difficult time mm. is that it also helped us to really understand our customers and know who are those customers that will stay with BPR no matter what. So for our customers who are able to go through this phase and stay with us, for me, um, I honestly owe everything that I am to them because I know that they went through a very difficult time. And every opportunity that I have, I say to our customers who have stayed with us, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, because it was really a vote of confidence mm -hmm. to the brand, to, to BPR, and the commitment, the one commitment I can make to our customers is from here, things will only get better. Yeah. That was the toughest time we could go through. Just think wow. about this. Wow. It was merging two systems mm -hmm. and then upgrading. So it was a very difficult exercise. There are banks which merge and just choose to continue running. Things. Separately, yeah? Absolutely. Mm. But we chose to take the bullet, go through the pain, so that we can also serve our customers better. Yeah. Absolutely. And again, the intention from the get-go was domesticate this bank. So, Absolutely. yeah, you really had to do everything you could do, yes. make sure there was no KCB mark anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely and that is right. the reality? It is the reality. Yes. At the end of the day, we're still 87% owned by KCB. 87%? Yes. Okay. We, we are part of KCB. We'll never take that apart. But at the end of the, of the day, we are Rwandan bank. We're a domesticated bank. 
um, you know, apart from that that eighty seven uh, percent, we still have almost thirteen percent that is owned by minority shareholders, mm -hmm. and those are over five hundred thousand of them, five hundred and ninety thousand local shareholders. We yeah. still have over a thousand staff of BPR, mm -hmm. of whom less than one percent are non Rwandan. So it's a Rwandan bank. Yeah. Our customer base is mostly, you know, individuals and small businesses, which are Rwandan businesses. So by all means, by all shapes and forms, we are a Rwandan bank, mm. a domestic bank. Yeah. Amazing. So with this merger, I wonder what you, I guess we, we went past the merger. What is BPR Bank doing today to ensure financial inclusion? There's a big population among us that mm -hmm. right behind us, there's a construction site mm -hmm. going on, uh, there's construction going on. And at that site, it's possible we've got a lot of people that are not um, banked, banked yes. yet. Yes. So what plan does BPR have for that group of people? Mm -hmm. So um, we pride ourselves, number one, in being the bank with the largest network. So today we have over 150 branches across Rwanda. But you could ask the question, is 150 branches sufficient to serve the market? And the answer is no. I think the future of banking is really in digitalization. So we are making a lot of investments today to make sure that a, a BPR customer, regardless of what segment they're in, they're able to get banking services at their fingertips. So digitizing the customer journeys uh, along the way and making sure that it caters for the needs for both the micro customers, the mid-sized customers, the large enterprises and corporates and everyone along that chain. So, digitization is, is really, really important. And that also includes even digitizing, you know, loans, for example. We have a product called Mobile Loans, where halfway through the month, you've run out of, of, of salary, you can request for a quick loan. Uh, on the phone. On the phone, right. So, you know, a lot of, of what we're doing is around uh, just making sure that we, first of all, really, really understand our customers, understand their journey, and make sure that along the way everything is digitized, including even account opening, which in the past hasn't been um, uh, that straightforward. It's been very you know, paper-based. Um, the other thing is also widening our network through an agency model. Right now, we recognize that uh, we don't have as many agents to reach the, the, the parts where the, the parts of the country where our branches cannot work. Mm -hmm. So we are also building uh, our agency banking model to bring on board more agents that can mm -hmm. then serve our customers wherever they are. But finally, also getting into partnerships uh, that help us to serve those customers better. Because we have to recognize that any commercial bank uh, will need to get into a partnership with the likes of SACOs uh, mm -hmm. to help serve, especially the smaller customers, because at the end of the day, the transaction costs for commercial banks tend to be a bit high. And so we, we, um, meet, we mitigate against that risk by getting into partnerships with SACOs, uh, with MFIs, uh, to help us serve a larger customer base. Mm. Your experience starting off at a microfinance mm -hmm. and here you are, Bank Populaire means it's the bank of the population and majority of the population could be small time bankers. How has that experience helped you in the execution of your role today? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's still helping me. I think um, being involved with micro businesses really taught me one important lesson that never to um, despise small beginnings. I have customers, I, I said I was in microfinance in 2004, and along, um, in, in those few months that I was with, to, beginning of 2005, sorry, in those few months that I was in a microfinance, the kind of loans we were giving were up to a million for small businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Your typical SACO customer. But people who needed very quick working capital to fix an, an, an urgent need, um, so that they can scale their business, and we were walking the journey with them. I can tell you that when I went into co commercial banking, it was these customers who were borrowing one million that have now grown, and next they're borrowing five million, and they kind of outgrow the microfinance and become your customer mm -hmm. in the banking space. So the microfinances play a critical role in also helping to prepare customers for uh, for banks. Yeah, so bringing that right. knowledge into the banking space. It's, it gave me an appreciation of, number one, the role of MFIs in our financial inclusion journey, mm -hmm. but also, number two, 
uh, helping to helping us to understand how best to serve the cust these these customers that we're then preparing to be the long term customer of the bank. So that that has helped me in that yeah. sense. Yeah. And then how about the people that I want to specifically talk about farmers, for example, people who will go out, plant their crops, but then because of climate change or the different seasons, they will not be able to get out of the farm what they intended. And most of these people also complain that the reason they struggle at that level is because banks don't see them mm. as people that uh, have or could be of value to the bank. Mm. What are you doing to change that trend? Because there will always be a big population that is into agribusiness. Mm. And then there's agribusiness on different levels. Yeah. There's the very small scale and there's what is high end. And today with technology, the people who are in that space. Mm. So what are you, what do you hope to do for the people that are um, at that level mm. and they also want to be assisted financially? Yeah. I think the solution for these kinds of businesses is really around uh, becoming part of cooperatives because let's be honest with ourselves. A farmer who is uh, farming on one or two acres of land and relying on uh, you know, natural climatic conditions mm. for rain to come at the right time, the sun to come at the right time, let's be honest, it's very risky business. And banks are not trading their own money. This is one thing we always have to remember. We are holding money in trust for our depositors. And so our credit making decisions are really, really important because we are responsible to our depositors. We need to keep their money safe. This is why risk is very important for banks. So the solution for such uh, small-scale farmers is usually around organizing themselves into cooperatives. And then the risk profile of these cooperatives reduces because they get into partnerships with large-scale traders. If you take rice as an example, a rice trader cannot survive on their own. A lot of, and I think the government has done a fantastic job in terms of getting these rice farmers to organize into cooperatives. The cooperatives then get into long-term agreements with large traders who buy the rice from them, process it, package it, sell it. At, at a, of course, at, at a margin. Uh, and then promise some revenues to you know these co corporates or to the corporates, pay yeah, money or the to the corporates, mm. and because of that of taker agreement, that really reduces the risk profile of the farmer. That's one thing. So organizing them into cooperatives. But the other aspect is also around making sure that we have insurance products that can help mitigate against the risks of you know climate change. Because yeah. you know today you might have a bumper harvest next season. You know something mm. goes wrong. So insurance, I think, plays a critical role for the financial sector, for banks, to de-risk uh, the agriculture space. Now, insurance for agri-insurance is still a space that is under, under, uh, you know, underdeveloped uh, in Rwanda and the region, in fact, the entire continent. So we're just uh, looking out now for uh, insurance companies that can help us design a product that can make this sector a lot more attractive for the bank. Wow. We're talking to Patience Mutese. She is the managing director of BPR. And it's, for me, quite an enlightening uh, conversation. I hope that you're also able to get something, especially that part. And the reason I asked the question on uh, small farmers is because we attend a lot of events and those farmers are always decrying the fact that banks don't see them as you had from patients, but also efforts that the government is making, you're better off organizing yourselves in different groups, and that way you will be assisted easily. My name is Jackie. We are coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel. Do stay with us because The Real Talk will be back. Welcome back to The Real Talk. Please use the hashtag The Real Talk and ask any questions that you have. Patients will be online. I will be online. BPR, the official Twitter handle. Any one of those will respond to your question or comment. Patients, Rwanda has a big number of women heading banks, yourself and several other females. But I recall vividly, I attended a bankers summit sometime last year. I can't remember the name of uh, the event. And the room was full of men. Mm. It left me wondering, is it that we don't have women in the banking sector? 
or do we have them, but it's just that the, pos the high positions are not really theirs? Okay, they could be high here, but then the middle, they go missing. Probably a lot of them are down there. Mm. Is, that, is that a fact, that mm. there are many women, yeah. but they're just probably not visible because of the positions that they have in the banking sector? Yeah. Uh, I think across the board, across all the banks that you'll talk to, there's one thing we have in common, that at entry level, you either have more women coming in than men or boys and girls, because usually entry level, they're fairly young, um, more girls than boys um, at entry level. But as you go up that ladder, like you said, there's less and less women going up that ladder. Uh, and more women, uh, sorry, more men stepping up uh, mm -hmm. the career ladder in banking much faster. I think logically speaking, there's a way to, to justify it, but mm -hmm. which is something that we are really trying to change because you come in probably entry level, you're a teller, and then you know, you're in the bank two years and then you get married, you probably uh. get pregnant, uh, focus less on you know, career advancement and more balancing family. your responsibilities in the family. All the while, the other person is just focusing on the career. Even if they get married, up. it doesn't affect exactly, their trajectory. Exactly. Mm. And so the, you know, the balance between family life and career life is something that is real. And you see it in that curve, in the career curve in all banks. Um, but a lot can be done. Um, we have to think about ways in which we can keep a woman advancing in their career and not feeling like they have to give up their family to grow their career. You know, so um, I like that within banking we have uh, a community of support. So today there is um, a Women in Finance Foundation that has been set up. And really what we are trying to do there is to break down you know, the challenges that we are facing in the financial sector mm. to change the dynamics. I mean, today, at least half of the banks are led by women. What is it that we're doing every day to make sure that we bring more and more women you know, up that career curve? Yeah. Um, it's a work in progress. I don't think there's any uh, simple answer to the question, but it takes a lot of advocacy. It takes a lot of uh, mentoring. It takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of networking. I think it's yeah. great that you know you have so many women leading banks because that also shows that it's possible. It That's shows true. That, you know the person that is coming in that you know what it's actually possible. I could do this. I might forego things here and there, but it's possible. But it can be done. It mm. can be done. And I'm the mentorship is already there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If we're to meet again after five years, what kind of business do you think BPR will be at that time? So I think about that in, um, in terms of the different stakeholders that we have in, in BPR. For me, the most important stakeholder being the BPR employees. Right, I know you you were expecting me to say the customer. Yeah, but I take care of the employees <laughs> to make sure that our customers are taken care of. You know, I, like oh, I said, we yeah. we have almost a million customers. I'm not going to take care of a million customers. It's the staff that we have that are going to take care of the customers. So for the employee, BPR is going to be the best place to to work, the most um, fun place to work and a place of work that encourages wholesomeness. I want to see people who bring their best mind, spirit, and soul to work and really, really enjoy working at BPR. So five years down the road, you can, you can check again. That's who BPR will be. And I have a then, feeling I'll be working there. That's I the kind of it. place I want to work I in. I love it. I cannot <laughs> wait for that. And then for, for our customers, mm. just the, a, a, a place that really values them a place where you enjoy interacting, a bank where you enjoy interacting and being served by a bank, a bank that understands them mm -hmm. and, and can offer bespoke services um, depending on where they are in life. For the customer, that's going to be who BPR is going, it will be. For our stakeholders, the best investment decision you could ever make that gives you value for your money for every coin that you have invested in BPR, I want us, our shareholders to feel like I couldn't have put my money anywhere else. Yeah. And really for the regulator, because you could do all that and still fail regulatory-wise, for the regulator, I want us to be the most compliant financial institution in this country and the region. 
Wow. That's who BPR will be. Amazing. That is such a beautiful vision that you have. And may all that come to pass. Amen. Is the bank currently involved in any CSR? Absolutely. So we have two themes uh, over, on, on our CSR. Um, two themes that we focus on. Number one is on education. And with education, not high school, not university, but mostly TVET training. So yeah. every year we have a program called Ijire, where we go out to the market and um, source for students that want to get into different uh, spheres of TVET training. So catering services, mechanical, plumbing, because we realize a big gap you know, in terms of the employability of the people that are getting out of school. Mm. And we, we still The skilled need, force. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So these technical skills are really important and there's a big gap there. Mm. So when it comes to education, that is the space we have decided to focus on. And then the second space is around enterprise development. So, and, and we link that too, because for the people that have gone through the, this Tibet training, usually they get out of this training with very good ideas mm -hmm. on businesses that they want to start. So we help them with you know, seed funding once they have done their business plans and they've gone through you know, all the testing to see that it's actually a good business. Then we provide them with seed funding to scale their business. So enterprise development is also another aspect that we're looking at. So we, for right. now we have chosen to focus on those two areas, mm -hmm. but then a, a cross-cutting theme is around uh, um, also climate change and how do we um, support really mitigation against climate change. So right now we have um, a program around tree planting in all the countries where KCB is currently present, mm. so tree planting and working with the ministries of environment around the, that area. You know, those are two good areas that uh, you are focusing on, and as you said, linking them, because I realized that, um, I, and I guess I'm not the only one, as you've said, we'll have very many universities churning out university graduates who were given a chance, most of them would fail to do the actual work, so that TVET the skills are necessary. What career advice would you have for a young professional, somebody that is thinking, maybe I want to go the banking way? Mm. If not the bank, something related to that. Because again, our, they're related. Our experiences in the workspace are related. Mm. Using your experience, what advice would you give such a person? I mean, it's, it's a lot. But for me, um, I think the most important thing in everything that I'm going to say, I think this is the most important thing. I'm such an advocate for service, right? If you have a heart to serve, there will always be opportunities. The only problem is that all of us get out looking for opportunities to be served. So you're thinking about, I need to earn this money, I need to get this, I need to get that. So that limits the options that you have available. But if you go out there looking for an opportunity to serve, that opportunity to serve may not really provide much value in the start, but it's going to give you a very good foundation to then build on to the next thing. And service is everywhere. There's no single thing that you will do that you're not serving. That's true. You are serving me right now. I'm serving you. Yeah. You know, everyone. We're all this, servants. We are servants. Yeah. So for me, I'm such a big proponent for service and just looking for every opportunity that you have available to serve. Number two, find something that you're good at and focus on that. So even as you're serving, you'll thrive if you're serving in an area that you are good at as an individual. Case in point, I just really love talking to people. I just really love engaging with people. <laughs> yeah. And so that's my area of service, <laughs> yeah. you know, and listening, you know, just yeah. trying to, to hear someone's life story. How did you mm -hmm. get where you are? And I really, really enjoy that. Maybe somebody else that is more introverted will not enjoy that. So yeah. I'll give you one example. There's a time I was dealing with a, fr a, a colleague who got promoted and went into a position where they were expected to, uh, as a relationship manager, right? Mm -hmm. So in the banking space, a relationship manager is kind of seen as a little senior than a credit analyst, for example, right? Uh -huh. So she was getting promoted from credit analyst to relationship manager. Mm -hmm. But the people who are making that change did not re realize that she just does not enjoy dealing with people. So she became a relationship manager and was oh. not performing. Yeah. So I had an she didn't really enjoy her job. She didn't. Yeah. I had an honest conversation and said to her, 
you know, really, what happened? You were such mm. a great analyst. Why did things change when you became a relationship manager? And I realized it's because she enjoyed working on her laptop. Yeah. So finding what you're good at mm -hmm. also means that you need to have self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You need to know yourself, know the areas where you will thrive and look for opportunities in those areas where you will thrive. Number three is around responsibility. I think as generations go by, we tend to put the responsibility for our failure into someone else's hands. Yeah. I think we need to take utmost responsibility in not only our successes, to say I'm here because I did X, Y, and Z, but also the failures. Recognize mm -hmm. where you're failing, take responsibility, and learn, learn lessons. Every failure that you have, there's a lesson to learn mm -hmm. there. And then accountability. You are accountable to people around you. If you're working in a team, you are accountable to your to team. team. Um, you're never going to be an island. There's nowhere in this world where you're going to work as an island. Mm -hmm. You always have to work with people. So you have to also ha be accountable to yourself primarily, but also to the people around you. So th those are a few things that I would say. I mean, I could go on and on and on based on mm -hmm. my <laughs> experience, but mm -hmm. let me keep it just to those four areas. Those are great, great pieces of advice. The part of failure, I remember somebody saying, I may have failed a lot of times in my attempt to get ahead, but I didn't really fail, I learned. Yes, yeah, so Absolutely. with every failure, you think it's failure, but no, this is something you have learned. Oh, great. We will be moving to six Qs. Now, those are easy, quick, personal questions. Before we get away from the bank, is there any question you wish I had asked and I didn't? Well, I will ask you a question. Okay. Not, not, not say this. <laughs> Shoot. I, I would love for you to share with me your experience as a BPR customer. Yeah. I say our staff are the most important stakeholders for me, um, but that's because at the end of the day, we all exist to serve people like yourself. So yeah. you are more important than my most important stakeholder. So Aww. I would love to hear from you what your experience is and... Yeah. What is it that you would say, you know what, if BPR you could change this, mm. you would be an AE bank. So I'm wondering, the, the part of what could be changed, I'm not sure if I have that, but my experience so far, it's been six years, when I had just gotten here, I moved around looking for a bank. And sometimes I can get petty. I can leave a bank just because the first person I met did not smile. I am like that, you know, service for me, Customer care is everything. You could be dealing in the best product there is in the world, but if you just don't recognize your customer, then I am done with you. And I went to two different banks. I did not feel welcome. Then I went to this bank, and I'll never forget this lady. She's called Irene. She was the first person I met when I reached the head office. It was still, still where the main building is, but now behind the small yeah. place. Yes. And she welcomed me. She did not know me. Yeah. Sometimes when we say this, I will say, it's because it's you. But no, I had just arrived. I had not even gone on air yet. She did not know me. But Irene was courteous. She was warm and gave me all the time there was yeah. to go through every single thing that I needed to understand. And... Since then, there was never a time I felt like an outsider. My calls will be answered, my emails. I have made personal friendships in that place. I keep saying, for me, BPR is, it's not my bank, it's my family, it's my home. Oh, you know, this. it's my home. Yeah. It doesn't matter where I am. Even when I have traveled, if I need help, somebody will be available to sort me out. Joseph is another guy who comes to my rescue each time. If there's something he cannot do, he will quickly make calls or assign somebody and I will be assisted. And I think as a customer mm -hmm. for a bank that has a lot of people to serve, if you can afford to spare time and make me feel special and the next customer and the next customer, it means you're in the right business the business of making us feel appreciated and valued. And as you said, you're not using your money. When you go out there and you get involved in all these money-taking ventures, it's not your money, it's the depositor's money. But see, we will not complain because we know that it's in the right hands. I love that. Thank and you for sharing you know, your story. My pleasure. You have to give me Irene and Joseph's contact so that I can reach out to them. I myself. will, yeah. I will. And you know, I'm so the other day after, after they moved to the head office, I think Irene must 
must have been taken to a different branch. Mm -hmm. But recently I went back and found her there and oh, we oh, gave each other the biggest hug. I was really lovely. happy to have her sit on her desk. She, like I was used to finding her there. And so going through the merger, I didn't feel that as much, even though I told you I contemplated leaving, that was not ever, ever, it was never going to be an easy decision because mm -hmm. it would be like you're running away from your family Probably. because, you know, you? how can you? <laughs> so I, 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 I couldn't leave and mm -hmm. I did not feel it as much mm. because there was still a call here, a text there, mm. and some encouragement, which is a good thing. That's so nice. my experience at BPR, it's been the best. Yeah, so happy been the to best. hear that. I hope yeah. all our thousand plus staff listen yeah. to this interview and take on the character of uh, yeah. Irene and Joseph because we are not exactly. all the same. And yeah. uh, I know your experience is different. I'm sure there are people who have yes. been frustrated. Yeah. Again, I, I owe my appreciation to the, the customers who have stood by us through mm. this really difficult time. And like I said earlier, the toughest times are behind us. I'm yeah. really hoping that we'll have more and more customers picking up BPR the way you just did. That's exactly. It's very nice to hear. I'm so <laughs> Thank happy. you, Beth. My pleasure. You. And for you who's watching, if you have any issues with BPR Bank, please don't keep it to yourself. And don't go around talking behind their back. Say something to the people responsible. Send a DM. If you don't have Pesha's number, she's on Twitter and always available. Send a DM. She will help you out. If she won't do it personally, she will find somebody to do that. Let's get into that habit of speaking out when we don't feel appreciated by a service provider. Don't be quick to leave them. No, stay with them and help them rectify those places that need to be corrected. This is The Real Talk. We're coming back with six cues. Welcome back to The Real Talk. Our guest today is Pesh. I love to call her Pesh, but you might prefer to call her Patience Butesi. She is the managing director of BPR. That's my bank. <laughs> <laughs> Question number one. What is the best life advice that you have ever received? Yeah. And, I from, would, and who gave you the advice? Yeah, so um, I have two parents, so I'm going to talk to, talk about the, the thing. Both they, of them. Both of them, okay. definitely. So I, I might have mentioned earlier, my dad mm. always said, whatever you choose to do, be excellent at it. Mm. Be the very best at it. My mom always said to us, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto man. And what that really means is, and I like that both of them are actually talking about work. Yeah. So they've given us, uh, my siblings and I, they have put in us a culture of work. Because really, we're here to serve, we're here to work. Yeah. What are you doing if you're not serving, right? Yeah. And I like that all of them point to the fact that you're not doing it for everyone else. First, it's to your creator, mm. do it to the best of their ability, but also to you. Do it to you to the best of your ability. So that has been the best advice I've had. Beautiful. What do you do for self care? So my approach to self care is that uh, it covers three aspects. It covers the spiritual, it covers the mental, and it covers the physical. I know that most times when we talk about self care, we focus a lot on the physical, mm. uh, but I will touch on all those three. For spiritual, I really need to be spiritually alert to feel well for my wellness. So just making sure that I have opportunities for fellowship. I go to church every Sunday and Wednesdays when possible, I join a cell group. So then we discuss the word of God and just it keeps me grounded yeah. and mentally well. So that speaks to both the physical and, and the mental. For wow. mental, I would really love to do more reading, mm. uh, but time has become so scarce. Um, so just listening to podcasts, podcasts. That, that helps me a lot. Mm -hmm. And then for the physical, uh, I pride myself in being a gym uh, enthusiast. Uh -huh. And that's for the last three weeks, by the way. Oh, but goodness <laughs> me. <laughs> but you you said it. <laughs> you pride in yourself. Yeah, that week, three weeks pride. <laughs> yeah, so just making sure uh, that I have time for, you know, exercises, mm. massage. I would love to have more time for massage. But my best, my most favorite thing to do is taking walks by myself, yeah. listening to a podcast. For me, that's the utmost 
self-care. Self -care. Yes, I love that. What word best describes you? People lover. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is my kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> yes. such an extrovert. Yeah. For me, a good day is a day when I met somebody different and we had a random conversation mm. which was enlightening. That is the best day that I could ever have. Yeah. yeah. That would describe me perfectly. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I think God created some of us to just draw a lot of energy from people. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and then what is that thing that people don't know about you? So I, um, I don't know if they don't know this. I think mm. I'm, a, I'm a daredevil in, in some ways. I'm adventurous. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I think that, but you might not look like it, yeah, but you I certainly might, are. Yeah, yeah, I might not look like it, but yeah. I'm going bungee jumping. And I remember after the bungee jump, it was in <laughs> Victoria Falls in Zambia. Gosh. And as I'm getting off that rope, mm. one of the guys who are helping us is like, you don't look like you have any problems. Why would you go bungee jumping? That's the thing. <laughs> For the thrill of it. So probably that's something people don't Gosh, know. Gosh, yeah. No, yeah. bungee jumping, I, yeah. I have stayed away from that, like I really know. far Next away from sky it. skydiving. You will do that as well. Definitely. Oh, no, Definitely. not me. You'll do it alone. <laughs> <laughs> Are you adventurous? Are you I am adventurous, but yeah. there are just things I don't really consider yeah. adventurous. Yeah. Things that could potentially threaten my life, right. like bungee and jumping. And then also as you grow older, yeah. I, I'm not as much of a daredevil as I was yeah. back then, yeah. because there's a lot of you giving up, <laughs> risking, True. you know. I think there are things you'll easily and quickly do at the age of 17, exactly. and not at 47 or 57. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then what has been the highlight of your career? You look back at all the years you've been serving people, and you say, this is it. You know, I think I'm living the highlight now. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, and I would probably say that about every phase of my career. Mm. I'm living um, that highlight right now, just being able to serve the needs of different people. Every once in a while, someone saying to me, you know, you saved, uh, you saved my business. We were at the very end of the thread and you came in because of one decision you've made we've been able to now make these changes so wow. um yeah i'm living the highlight of my career right now mm. as md of bpr beautiful you carry that position so much elegance thank you yeah and god's grace oh. it is the grace you know I, I'm, it's no wonder that you mentioned spirituality yeah, yeah among the self-care things and lastly there could be somebody that is watching and they draw a lot of inspiration from you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe they say, I want to be like you. Mm -hmm. And you could possibly tell them, not be like me, be better than me. That's true. So such a person that draws inspiration from you, what would you say to them? I, I'll probably repeat what I said. Find something that you enjoy and really nurture that. Um, enjoy the journey, even mm. through the challenges. At the end of every day, just think about, you know, what is it that I learned today, you know, despite the challenges. Um, find a community of people that will also help you get better. Because we, we can only, we are only as good as the people. As the people, the company us. we keep, you right. know. Yeah. Yes. So find people around you that will challenge you, that will encourage you to get better. Mm. And be daring, you know, don't. Yeah. Don't wait for someone to tell you you can do this. Take a step that scares you. You know, do the things that scare you. Because, I mean, you think about it on average, what's the life expectancy in Rwanda? Mm. Uh, or even the region? Like, Let's say you live 65? to 65? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's say you live to 80. Yeah. I mean, that's not very many years, mm. you know? So while you're here on Earth, um, mm. dare to do something different, something that scares you. Because at the end of the day, when you look back, it's that scary stuff that is going to make your life exciting. Yeah. That's what will be memorable. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for those beautiful words. Thank you. It's been a, such a great pleasure to have this conversation with you. I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks I'm glad for you considering have. me among your first. Uh, Thank you. you know, My pleasure. Yes, I've enjoyed it very much. My pleasure. Thanks Thank you. And time. we hope to have you back soon. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our guest was Patience Mutesi. Please find her on social media. Follow her. Follow BPR Bank. You should follow me as well. Oh, and RBA as well. Yes. <laughs> and talk to us. The hashtag is The Real Talk. If you have a question or a comment about this conversation, please let us know. If you have 
any issues with the bank, as I said earlier, please let them know. Somebody on the other end is waiting to serve you. As you can see, they're led by a servant. And so indeed, they will be glad to come to your service. It has been a pleasure to host the program. I do hope to see you again next week. You take care. God bless you.